for this is our third Sunday of Advent. Next Sunday, we'll essentially celebrate Christmas. It'll be our Christmas Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Advent, our time of preparation and anticipation coming to a close. We're over the halfway point. And we've been exploring this question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And on this third Sunday of Advent, we pause to think about joy. And we ask ourselves, when we think about joy, are we there yet? Are we at joy yet? Week one, we talked about peace. Week two was hope. Week three, it's about joy. Are we there yet? But, but you may ask yourself, in the midst of, of, of seeking uh, joy, in the midst of this Advent season, you may ask yourself a very basic question. What is joy? I mean, I've heard people say, uh, you can't steal my joy, or don't let anybody steal your joy. My granddaddy used to sing that song, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. But what is joy? What even is it? I mean, maybe you've heard in Scripture uh, the mention of joy in Nehemiah 8 and 10. It says the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Psalm 20, it says, may God grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation. Psalm 30, sing praises to the Lord, O oh, you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name, for God's anger is but for a moment, thank you, Jesus, and God's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And for you New Testament people, you know, sometimes church folk get up and they're like, why are we dealing with the Old Testament? We need, well, I got something for you. All right. In the New Testament, joy is mentioned all over the New Testament. In Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which you need. Against such things, there is no love. Joy in the New Testament. Oh, but that's in the epistles. What about the Gospels? Well, it's in there too. We got something for you. Luke 15. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Oh, oh. But that's Luke. What about Matthew? Matthew says, Matthew 2, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That means they had a shown up party. <laughs> And in our text for today in Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Are we there yet? Probably not. But don't become discouraged because you're not there yet. Because you may not understand what joy is or... It's not expressed in your journey the way it's mentioned in Scripture. I mean, and you can take heart in knowing that you can only ask the question, are we there yet, if you move from where you once were. You have to be on a journey in order for the question to have relevance. If you're sitting still, you know where you are. I'm just saying. So as you journey from here to there in pursuit of the question, are we there yet? You still must know what joy is and how to recognize and covet it with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And I believe Psalm 16 helps us get from here to there. Are you ready? Yes. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. 
you might want to write this down. It's going to help you on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And that's probably it because y'all not going to work yet on Friday anyway. So let's we'll get, get you about Thursday. But in pursuit of this question, are we there yet? And are we there with joy just yet? And we look at Psalm 16. The first thing that can help us uncover this a little bit is that we have to trust God as our daily portion. We have to trust God as our daily portion. Right there in 16.5. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. See, when I trust God as my portion, it means that God provides me with exactly what I need. It means that God provides me nourishment. It believes that God gives my portion that feeds me on a daily basis. For we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Do we not believe what we pray? For God gives us our portion. God gives us enough. And here's a news flash. God has already made us enough. He's already made us enough. And if I want to build my confidence with God, I, I need to see that God provides for me on a daily basis. And that's not always easy to do. And it's not always easy to recognize. Because in our society, it, we're taught to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Y'all ever heard that? Yes. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And we say that kind of stuff without any regard for those who don't have boots. <laughs> or those who live life in such a way or life has been dealt to them in such a way that they've been strapped far too many times to even count. And we make such statements and we live vicariously through those statements without any regard for the fact that the many who labor to make boots are exploited laborers who are owned or manipulated within corrupt capitalistic systems that do little more than keep them bound to a system that will never set them free to create or to flourish on their own. And by there, I mean us. I mean ours. Yeah. We also live in a time when we believe we are responsible for what we have. You hear people say things like, I worked hard for this. That's why I have it. Y'all ever heard that? Yeah. You ever said that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> Prepare for an ouch. <laughs> because that may be true. Amen? You may have worked hard for it. May be true. But can you also know how you were able to work for it and to maintain what you had? Can you acknowledge that you didn't create yourself and you didn't create the opportunity and you weren't the one who sustained yourself day in and day out to be able to work hard? Oh, come on now. Y'all want to talk about Mary and Joseph and uh, the manager. You'll do all that. Come back next week. We're going to do that next week. Not today, amen? Not today. We're not doing that today. The only thing that's worse than that mentality is someone who feels entitled to be taken care of. See, on one end, you guys, I did it all by myself. On the other end, is somebody better give me and somebody better take care of me. Entitled. See, there, there's self-sufficiency and there is this thing that's called uh, laziness. <laughs> and I'm not talking about those who cannot take care of themselves. I'm talking about those who won't take care of themselves, even if you raise them and spoil them to be that way. I am who I am and I have what I have because of 
all this great wonderfulness. See, then, right, as soon as I get into that, that space, oh, y'all don't think this is great wonderful? <laughs> giving me that look. See, look, 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 look. <laughs> but as soon as we get in that space and think that we're all great and wonderful, we've stopped trusting God. We start believing we've done it and we're doing it all on our own. We've stopped trusting God. And we don't, and, and, and we get in that place, we don't even see the needs of other people. Because see, when we start thinking, I did it, like I worked hard, I'm doing, I got, I did, I have, we start looking at other people through that lens of why aren't they doing it? Why don't they? And why don't But see, when you, when you realize I am who I am, I have what I have, and I'm able to do what I'm able to do because of who God is and because of what God is working out, when we look at ourselves through that lens, we can then see the world through that same lens. Okay? See the world through that same lens, and that, that gives you a permission slip to climb down off of that judgment stool. <laughs> See, when I become so self-sufficient that I become so self-absorbed that I can't see that I have a future that is not wholly shaped by me or by my wind. Mm -hmm. God is my cup of blessing, the psalmist says. Amen. This means that God pours blessings in my life for me to drink. Because this life will have you parched. <laughs> Y'all watch the news lately? Checked your bank account lately? <laughs> Been in a bad relationship lately? <laughs> Trying to get in a bad one soon? <laughs> life will have you parched. So you need God to pour blessing in your life to fill you. Amen? Amen. Amen? And blessings are not all about finances. Yeah. I'm so sick of church folk. I mean, it's like they can't talk about blessing without talking about finances. Newsflash. When Psalm 16 was written, you go all the way to New Testament. It was written, there is no such thing as a U.S. dollar. So it wasn't even talking about that. It was not talking about your dollars. Now, can those dollars be used to bring about some blessing? Yes. But the dollar is not the blessing. The blessing is the one who provided it. Y'all let that go, right? And we have to trust and remember that a blessing is a reminder that God provides what we need. We don't provide it for ourselves. God provides it for us. God is our daily portion. Amen. Amen. Number two. Want to understand this joy thing? We have to see that God controls our future. Amen. It says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. God knows your future. Yes. God knows what will happen to you. God provides a wonderful inheritance for you. Do you know what an inheritance is? An inheritance is something that just comes to you. Just because you showed up in the world and hung around a while, it shows up for you, in you, because of who God is. And God has already prepared your future for you to receive. So God not only provides for my present, God also provides for my future. And guess what? God controls my 
future. Amen. So we have to trust God for a daily portion. We have to see that God controls our future. Can you handle the third one? Yes. Okay. The third one is we have to listen to God for counsel. You want to understand joy? We have to listen to God for counsel. The psalmist here in verse 7 says that we have to listen to God for counsel at night. I know this going to mess with you good time, but I'm just saying. <laughs> he says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my conscience instructs me. See, God uses your quiet and still times to instruct you. So if you're sitting there and you're going, well, God hadn't instructed me. Well, let's take inventory. When have you had quiet, still time? I'll wait. <laughs> God instructs in the quiet and still times. So sometime, you know, in the next few days, let's say in the next week, next seven days, Next seven days, think about, you know, like once a day. Okay, that's too much for you. Okay. <laughs> so in the next seven days, like at some point during one day, take an hour. Oh, that's too much? Okay, so at some point in the next seven days, just just take take like like a little bit. Fifteen minutes? <laughs> Okay, okay, I think I got my crowd here. So sometime in the next seven days during a commercial, <laughs> just turn the volume on mute. You don't even have to turn it off. Just put it on mute, okay? Just, just, just during the span of a commercial. What's that, about two minutes, three minutes? It's a really good show, you know? So, so just, just, just identify some time where you can be still and quiet for a few minutes and listen for God. Amen. Amen. I mean, you know how it is to try to get somebody's attention when they're rustling around and busy and trying to cook and clean and argue and fuss and look online and find the phone and walk the dog and, you know, get rid of the cat and all this other kind of stuff that's going on. So, I mean, the same thing is happening in your spiritual life. You got all this stuff going on. Sometimes you need to pull away. You need to pull aside. We're not saying you need to go join a monastic community. But what we're saying is you need to be intentional about time that you set aside to be still and quiet to listen for God. Even when you go to sleep, let's say the next seven days you've got so much going on, even me mentioning you sitting still for three minutes is like, you're driving you crazy and getting your anxiety on 10. Just, just, okay, 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 I understand. But think about even just when you go to sleep. <coughs> Be intentional about going to sleep. Don't just fall asleep. Go to sleep. Y'all know the difference? It's sort of like, you know, like, like Denny's. You know, Denny's isn't somewhere you go, it's somewhere you end up, right? See, so you don't want your sleep to be like Denny's. You want it to be, you want it to be somewhere you end up. You want it to be somewhere you actually go. And then you set an intention about what you're going to do. And the reason we set an intention about going to sleep is, see, you can pray before you go to sleep. And you can pray, God speak to me even while I sleep. Because I remember the psalmist said, I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. And so God, I'm trusting your word. So I'm going to trust you to speak to me even at night. Now don't y'all call Denny's on me. Because <laughs> on August 20th, I'm going to get my free breakfast. I'm going. I'm going. Amen. Because God wants to give you counsel. God wants to know you are open to counsel. That you have to be ready to listen to God. Now, some say, I wouldn't know the voice of God if God were to speak to me. 
Well, have you ever truly sat still and waited for God to speak? So, we have to trust God as our daily portion. We have to see that God controls our future. We have to listen to God for counsel, even if it's at night. Can you handle a fourth one? Can you do one more? Can you do one more? That's, here it is. Here it is. So, we trust God for our daily portion. We see that God controls our future. We listen to God, counsel us, even if it has to be at night. And number four, to understand this joy thing. We have to accept that God keeps you eternally secure. Yeah. You want to understand joy? You have to accept that God keeps you eternally secure. Because mm -hmm. God is always near you in life. Amen. He says, I will keep the Lord in mind always. Because God is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also rests securely. See, this keeps you secure to know that God is near you. This is why you can be anxious for nothing. No matter what's going on around you, knowing that God is with you. So God is always near you in life. But get this, God will not abandon you in your hell, even, it's, even if it's of your own making. Yes. Oh, that blessed my soul right there. Yes, it did. For the psalmist says, for you will not abandon me to Sheol, that's hell. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. Why? Because God provides eternal security through this life and well into the next, beloved. Your security doesn't begin when you die. Your security begins while you are living. God is holding you. God is standing near you. God is standing by you. God is protecting you right now. You want to understand joy? You've got to understand that. So when we trust God as our daily portion and we see that God controls our future and we listen to God to counsel us even if at night and it interferes with our good time at least one time a week and we accept that God keeps you eternally secure, that cements your joy. Yes. That inward settling. Joy begins on the inside and may be seen on the outside. See, we, we get happiness and joy all messed up, and we use them synonymously when they are two very different things. Happiness is something that's very external, and it's about what's happening. Joy is an internal thing. You may or may not see it, but baby, you best believe you got to have it. Because it's going to sustain you in the midst of some craziness. Amen? That ability to face what comes and know you will be better than okay. That's joy. That openness to look for God in others and ensure others experience God through you. That's joy in making that happen. Joy is a cause for something. It has an effect on you and your ability and willingness to be present. Even when everything around you says that you need to be somewhere high. Joy, it is settled but not static. Joy is knowing without boasting. Joy is bending but not breaking. Joy is sitting without sulking. 